what really brings us together is um, is about excellence in women's ice hockey. And yet, what I've also been hearing as well is that the vast majority of you are working with the youngsters and uh, with, with an aim of growing the game, loving the game. And I'd like to acknowledge that those are not two disparate goals. In fact, they are directly related to one another. One builds on the other. And I know that we are here because of ice hockey. Really, what we are here is about building sport and a love of being physically active for young girls so that they can have their initial experiences be very positive, but to let it last for a lifetime. Even if, even if they are part of the very, very few that to get that get to wear their country's colors, even when they hang up their jersey, their cleats, whatever their sport discipline here is, we hope that they continue to live and, and love sport. Now this is one of my added slides. I know that as coaches, and I know that even as many of you are coaches, you're probably wearing another hat, so the parents and administrators, directors, and so on. And I don't know, but I often find right about now when you've been getting all of these great ideas, everybody's excited about the great ideas, but then you're also thinking, how am I going to put this on an already full plate? And it becomes daunting. And what I enjoy most about coming and speaking to an organization is when we can collaborate, when we can share, and not worry about whether or not we are in one country or another. Um, and dare I say, regardless of what sport we come from, because a lot of the things that we can do for young girls in sport are not different because of sport. There's a lot of shared resources that we can all benefit from. And I encourage you to do that because good people like yourselves, if you do try to do it by yourself, um, you won't be with us very long. Um, you will get burnt out, you will have other demands, because the vast majority of coaches, certainly in Canada, do not get a paid income or make a career of coaching. We do it because we love it. So I'm going to actually start, though, with a bit of a, uh, a dark forecast, and it sets the stage as to why this becomes so important. So a bit like uh, not so much Houston we have a problem, but we have a problem that we're all very aware of. And that is we are fat and are getting fatter. The most shameful thing is that our children are also fat and getting fatter. Now, does that matter? I think it does. And again, you could probably quote the numbers. You could quote some of the problems. Um, and if I were to ask you right now, what do you think the reason is for this situation happening at levels that we've never seen before? What are some of the reasons? Yes. Fast food and video games. Anything else? Hectic lifestyles, absence of physical education. Yes, yeah. Yes. The, the, yeah, the quality of food, the time that we take around meals, and those are all the same. And I may show you some numbers that, that might be a little bit different between Canada and the U.S., but we are, as North Americans, we suffer from the same issues that you just mentioned. Now, I also want to mention that I think we've got another problem, and this is raising children in a bubble-wrapped era. Uh, we're raising a generation of overprotected, unimaginative wimps. Uh, maybe you don't see a lot of them. But we also know that we have highly, highly structured environments. Uh, there's a, a phrase that adults are worried about our chi our, the childhood years being absolutely robbed from them. And that parents will often treat their children as if they were a project and as if the children's achievements will appear on the parents' resume. We do not wear our children's achievements on our chest like medals, and yet unfortunately many parents behave in such ways. And this too, we now have literature starting to show that the overprotectiveness of our parents are actually contributing to 
this huge, uh, the, the great number of physical inactivity woes that we are suffering from. Hence, the helicopter parent. And again, parents, I understand, want the best for their children. Yet, have we gone too far? Have we gone too far? So this contributes to our problems. And I also realize, too, that being able to create good, strong, welcoming sport programs are going to help alleviate some of these. We have also brought the outdoors from our children. No longer can we go outside without there being some veiled or real threat about that as well. And again, those of you that are uh, familiar with Richard Blue and this book, this was his first book, Last Child in the Woods and the Nature Deficit Disorder. There's a wonderful website, the Child of Nature <coughs> Network, which shows again an abundance of research demonstrating that being in the outdoors, playing in the outdoors, doing activity in the outdoors is important. And another, the great question that Richard Blue poses is that if we do not train children and expose them to the outdoors, who will be the stewards of our earth? We have criminalized play. We devalue unstructured free play. This to me is catastrophic and one of the greatest contributions as to why we do not have imaginative, creative children. This is catastrophic for elite athletes. Elite athletes who are being brought up in systems that are highly robotic, being told what to do, where to go, when to do it, without freedom of thought, freedom of play, the ability to fail and learn from that failure, that does not bode well for any type of elite athlete system, let alone for a future economy. Yes, there are wicked people out there who prey on children. However, it has created paralytic fear within many homes. We have confused the words risk and hazard. I'm not sure what it's like here in the US, but in many Canadian school playgrounds, they are ghost towns with exception of recess for those schools that still have recess. In Edmonton, very wintry, many playgrounds will absolutely close down because slides become too slippery. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> and the media. I hold the media highly responsible for this in the way in which they will perpetuate and stoke unnecessary fear and the way that they will recycle and rebroadcast stories to serve their own five to six second media fixes. And then, of course, we have, again, another note on parents. Overpressuring children, wanting them to be successful from the time they drop from the room. And it's sad to think that now we even have literature and books on that. Okay, that don't Hey, hey, you're going the wrong way. Come on, we got slaughtered at musical chairs. We've practiced this at home a million times. We are losing. I can't believe I missed Pilates for this. It's your own right home. <laughs> Laughable, but again, it cuts way, way too close to the truth around the way in which parents have really become the autopilot for a child's life. And what was mentioned earlier about the magic helmet, and again, being treated like an adult, and then realizing, actually, this is still a child. And then there is this voracious search for talent, expertise, giftedness. It is becoming a word in which we're actually having some discussion about whether we should actually abolish the word talent because again, it becomes so seductive to parents in thinking that there might be actually a prescriptive way of making their child, who might be genetically limited, into something very talented and wanted by many. This is what has become so appealing about the Canadian Sport for Life model, and which many of you are familiar with from the long-term athlete development. And on the bottom part, 
which shows the first three phases of long-term athlete development, you will see stretches across absolutely every single person. And what we believe strongly in is that, at least up until the age of 12, is that the major focus of children being engaged in physical activity and sport is to develop physical literacy. I'm sure many of you have heard the term physical literacy, and I'm actually going to show you what we are trying to develop as something a little bit more functional and working definition for physical literacy. But the three main aims of Canadian Sport for Life is to develop physical literacy and to improve excellent and per excellent performance as well as lifelong participation. And we get uh, challenged saying that these are somewhat disparate goals. And yet we believe that if physical literacy is done well, if every child becomes physically literate, has an opportunity to become physically literate, then when they are old enough, 12, 13, 14, that they will almost self-select into the sport of their choosing, of their own aptitude, of their own passion. We're confronted with way too great a number of children that are dropping out like flies out of sport, in particular girls, when they become old enough to say no to mom and dad, and when distractions become incredibly attractive compared to the demands of typical highly structured sport. We have a, the, what we call the Mothership website, Canadian Sport for Life, and any and all of those documents are there for the sharing, copying, discussing, and we are also not shy to put things out before they are perfect. I think it's terribly important that we put some of these, play, put some of these strategies into effect and try them without fear of them being perfect. We are so entrenched in set ways, in particular in sport, about making sure that it's perfect and terrified of conflict and people getting angry or, did, or uh, worried about what consequences might occur. And it becomes a paralytic type of response that we end up never changing. We have, uh, thanks to uh, funding from B210, uh, we have a microsite called Active for Life. And we are going after parents very, very hard in this way, trying to create parent-friendly mess messages that they can understand, that aren't too geeky, that are meaningful and persuasive for them. And it's largely about instilling physical literacy into a child's life. The other piece that Canadian Sport for Life is very committed to is a cross-sectoral engagement Absolutely every initiative that we apply, we apply it forward with sport, recreation, health, and education around the table. And sport, some of your best friends will be those people that live and reside within schools. Not that we're asking teachers to do more, but schools sit on rich real estate and they are also a captive audience for the kids that you will be working with between the months of September and June. Those are terribly important relationships to create. We're undergoing revision of the original resource booklet, which came out in 2005, about the 10 key factors. And I'm not going to go into all of these. And you can read these. And what I should mention again, uh, you know that Michelle will be um, circulating these notes. So um, don't worry that you'll, you'll have all of these in your hands. But again, one of the most stellar messages coming out of Canadian Sport for Life is that we have to stop treating our children like adults. And that is much easier said than done because some people are doing it because that's all they know to do. Again, coaches, because it's not a paid profession for most, is that many coaches, in absence of any type of training, will proceed with coaching the way they had experienced it themselves, and again, that might not take into account the needs and, and requirements for these young developers.